Hello, this is a history of ancient philosophy. My name is Mark Thorsby, and in this video we'll be looking at Aristotle's metaphysics. In particular, we will be looking at excerpts from book one and book four of the metaphysics. So welcome everyone, I hope you guys are doing well. So the first thing I want to sort of mention when I talk about Aristotle's metaphysics today is that this is the first of a three-part series on Aristotle's metaphysics where I will be looking closely at Aristotle's text. So I'm going to do something a little bit different than I've done in the previous videos. So uh, in the previous videos I essentially used this format where I have a prezi and I sort of go through the key ideas that are in the reading that we're covering that week. Um, but this week I want to do something a little bit different which is namely some of the, I don't want to just talk about um, I don't want to just give you a summary of Aristotle's text, but I want to show you, especially since Aristotle's text is fairly dense and difficult, I want to sh um, take you on a tour of the actual text itself. So you're going to see here that what I'm going to start off with here is a sort of brief remarks about the overall structure of the excerpts we're looking at from book one and book four, but then we're going to actually take a look at the text in depth. And so I'm hoping this will help out because also, I'm hoping that you can also recognize um, how many different ideas Aristotle is linking together in this text. Um, and hopefully, it'll also give you a sense that some of these texts, despite their initial difficulty, are not as opaque as they might seem. So anyway, that's sort of a brief remark about what we're going to do in this video and how it's going to be different than the previous videos we've done, or that I've done, I guess, <laughs> that you've watched. Um, so the first thing here is notes on the title of the metaphysics. The first sort of thing here is we talk about metaphysics and philosophy, and we actually mean a whole bunch of different things. The initial term metaphysics actually comes from this work, but ironically it doesn't come from Aristotle. The, the word metaphysics was actually uh, introduced by a librarian um, cataloging books, and we don't know whether the meta simply means after physics, like literally the book after the physics, or whether or not it means beyond, like beyond the physics. So there's actually unclarity here because this is not a term that Aristotle himself uses. Um, but we will see, though, that what Aristotle is talking about certainly fits within the rubric of our understanding of, of metaphysics as a as a genre in philosophy, if you will, as a set of questions, a type of investigatory field. So we'll be looking at Aristotle's metaphysics here, and it does contain his metaphysics, um, but you have to be aware here that the more precise um, argument that Aristotle lays out is what he calls the science of being qua being. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there in the text, but that's the first sort of thing to note. Um, what you're going to see here is this text is roughly, the, the excerpts that I've chosen here to take a look at, um, we're following along with the Hackett um, from Thales, uh, from, I'm sorry, from Thales to Aristotle, it's a Hackett anthology. I encourage you to purchase the text. You can also download it online. Um, and so you take a look at there. Of course, if you don't have it, you can always just read along with any version of Aristotle's metaphysics you have. So, but we're going to see in, in book one, Aristotle really begins with the sort of question, well, okay, what is a science? How do any be addresses such issues as what his epistemology is, what it means to gain knowledge, and so on and so forth. Um, and he's going to talk about the idea that ultimately a science is concerned with the principles and the causes of the subject it's studying. Because you're going to see here that the ultimate overall aim of this entire project in the metaphysics is to articulate exactly what, what philosophy is doing, how is philosophy gaining knowledge, and what type of new knowledge might philosophers gain. Uh, and whatever knowledge they gain is going to concern the principles and the causes of being as such. Um, and I want you to get the sense here that Aristotle is responding, building off of, um, the earlier philosophers we've actually taken a look at, and he's even going to catalog those philosophers. In fact, he's going to discuss, of course, the idea that there's four primary causes of being, and or, or at least he'll, he says, quote, there are four different ways in which a cause can be spoken of. Um, we've actually looked at the causes when we look to Aristotle's physics, and we'll see that they're the same causes, although he doesn't use the sort of easy terminology we gave in the previous um, video. So, 
Um, he then gives a sort of history of how each of the different philosophers, from Thales on, from Thales to Democritus, how each of these um, actually tries to answer the question of what the cause of being is, and as such they have different types of causes get illuminated within the philosophical history. Um, and then of course he's going to critique Plato. Um, and I'll be honest here, he actually doesn't give a fairly, um, he doesn't give a lot of details in his treatment of Plato, but he references a lot of arguments regarding why the theory of the form should be rejected. And so we're going to take a look at those in the reading today. Um, and I'm going to try to, if I can, uh, articulate what those arguments concern. Um, and of course, if you're interested in pursuing Aristotle's discussion of Plato, you'll have to look at a, his a range of his works in which he does talk about the forms or he talks about Plato in particular. Um, so we're going to get a little criticism of Plato today. The next sort of thing is we're going to begin just at the beginning of book four, Aristotle's own account, where instead of him looking at the history of what other philosophers have done, and laying out just some of the basic ground rules, he's going to begin his discussion, or not his discussion, he's going to begin his own metaphysics, his own science of being qua being, uh, being insofar as being. He's going to argue this idea, which is namely that ultimately philosophy aims at the first causes of all things. Um, and that means that philosophy is an investigation of the nature of being itself, the nature of existence itself, uh, because all of the knowledge we can gain in the other sciences, whether they be physics or chemistry, etc., all of that knowledge ultimately falls under the, if you will, the universal genus of being. Now, he doesn't think that being is a genus, uh, but he'll say that all of the primary genuses actually are enumerated underneath the heading of being. And so the question is, what are the first principles and what are the causes of being? And he's going to actually give us at the end of today's discussion in the reading uh, an answer to the first, what he considers to be the first principle of metaphysics, what we call the law of non-contradiction. Um, so we'll take a look at that and that's going to be sort of what we're looking at in today's video. So if you have with you, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump right into the text. Let me hide this here. I'm going to jump right into the text and I want... Okay. We're going to put this... I want to take notes on the side over here um, on this little notepad. And what I want to do is as we're sort of going through the text, I want to sort of pull out what I consider to be some of the primary elements from the reading. Now again, what I'm following along here is from the Hackett, and you can actually download the very same ebook that you see here. You're going to just see a small excerpt of, uh, but it's pretty cheap and it's pretty awesome. Uh, so anyway, let's sort of begin by talking about, so you can see like I mentioned earlier, the name of the, the later editor, who we think actually gave the name of the metaphysics, here is Dronicus of Rhodes from around the first century AD. So well after you know, centuries after Aristotle's death. Um, so there's a question here about what really is the subject. And interestingly enough, we'll see that Aristotle himself suggests the possibility that perhaps the type of knowledge that metaphysics seeks to find may not actually be possible. Um, he thinks it is to some degree, uh, but to another degree and in another sense, um, metaphysics seeks something like superhuman cognition, right? We're looking for something that actually is the basis for all of our other cognitions itself. So anyway, so book one here. And what you see here I've done is I've highlighted passages. Now, what I did, just simply as an exercise, especially for those of you who are first reading this philosophy, to see how it is you can begin to operate, is I actually went through and reread the metaphysics in the very same textbook. And you can see what I did is I highlighted specific individual passages and then wrote notes on the margin. Um, now, everyone has a different style, but I find personally that this is the best way to systematically study and read a philosopher's argument. Now, everyone has their own style, so you can ignore this. But what I've done today is all of the passages I've highlighted in the book, I went ahead and highlighted 
online on the screen here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from high, from each of the different passages I've highlighted, and I'm just going to raise, uh, raise the point that Aristotle has discussed um, and just sort of kind of mention and sort of talk a little bit about what Aristotle is doing. But you'll see here I want to stick as close as I can to the text. You'll notice here, here's the side pagination. Um, these are the numbers you can use universally to, to find any of these um, to find these texts. So the first sort of point, probably the most, one of the most famous quotes of all of Aristotle's, is this, is that all human beings by nature desire to know. All human beings want to know things, right? Um, this appears to be, um, if you will, a part of our very nature, that we're inquisitive and we have curiosity. And that curiosity begins, he says, um, as a symptom of this curiosity, is found in terms of how much we enjoy our senses. Now we have different organs for sensation, right? I have eyes, I have a nose, I have a mouth, I have taste, I have a tongue. Of course I can feel and I can smell and hear, right? Um, so I have these different senses. I have sight, hearing, um, taste, touch, and scent, right? And with these senses, I gain knowledge of the world around me. And I really quite enjoy these. In fact, he goes on to say that of all of the senses we like the most, we like sight the best. Why? The reason we like sight the best is because sight gives us the most amount of knowledge about the world in an immediate sense. Um, there's also, and so that's what he thinks. So he thinks sight is the primary sense um, that we use to gain the most amount of knowledge. Um, now, and so that so he begins with that, um, and, he's, and he then he compares uh, um, humans to animals here, and, and he says, for instance, animals also possess self perception. Uh, I'm sorry, sense perception at birth. So animals themselves have sense perception. So it's important to recognize that we have senses, and animals have senses. Um, you can see here. Well, He's going to argue, though, that the sort of science that we do in metaphysics is not something that animals do. I don't know about you, but I've never met an um, animal that does metaphysics. Um, so what is different? It can't simply be about our sense perception. Simply because we have senses and we can see the world is not enough to give us ultimately knowledge about the world. It gives us some knowledge. Um, so you and you can see this because animals have this and animals have perception and they have some degree of memory but that gives aristotle the clue it looks like human beings have a sophisticated sense of memory that allows us to if you will compound our perceptions into and also into expectations now i actually think there's a lot going on here and i think 20th century phenomenologists um, actually to go a long way in terms of uh, talking about the different nuances involved in sense perception. But this is not Aristotle's discussion. Um, though if you're interested, you might want to take a look at how phenomenologists have analyzed uh, Aristotle's metaphysics. Um, but let's go back to the text here, right? So for instance, non-human animals live by appearances and memories but have little share in experiences, right? So animals have, sen they have appearances and sense perception, and they have some memories, um, but it doesn't really, um, but they have little share in experiences, whereas human beings also live by craft and reasoning. In human beings, experience results from memory. Um, and so this is sort of important here, right? So you have this idea that we have senses, right? And then our senses get combined into memories, right? Um, but that there's something that happens in humans that doesn't happen in animals. Um, and that he's ultimately has to do here with reason, I think, um, especially because his conception of the soul is that humans are a rational animal. And that through reason, these memories get combined into experience. And he says you can see this, for instance, when you think about crafts. Right. So let's think about crafts. Right. So one of the things that I've been learning how to do in in the past year and a half is I've been learning how to brew beer, craft beer, as they say. Right. Um, which has been fun and difficult at the same time. 
And what is a craft? A craft is uh, essentially learning how to do something over time, right? Think of a carpenter knows a specific craft of wood making, right? A brewer knows a specific craft of brew making, right? So crafts result in something, but the but they but they involve a technique over time. You can see here that um, the author here gives us um, the Greek term here, which is techne, and techne is this idea. Um, of using something like a tool, right? It applies to the both to the state of having knowledge and to what someone in that state knows. So there's different types of knowledge, um, and techne is the type of knowledge he's talking about here. That's the word that craft is referring to, right? It's where and think about technology. I have a technique that I employ to get a specific result. So that's what a craft is, right? And a craft is is comes from experience for sure, right? Is that um, for instance, other, and go back to the case of home brewing, um, other people who brew beer have developed certain ways of doing it by experience. That is, they've made good batches and bad batches. And over time, right, and even across generations and spans of centuries, all of this craft has developed into a, into a series of techniques. Um, now, we can talk about the idea here is that um, the craft enables us um, to gain knowledge over time. So we can say that we have experience in brewing beer or something like this, or experience in wood making. Um, so there's this important sort of distinction between experience and craft. And we're going to counterpose this eventually with Aristotle's conception of science, because science is not the same thing as craft. Um, that's I, It's hard writing on this, so I apologize. That looks horrible in terms of the handwriting. So just because I hate it so much, I'm going to... Go ahead and start a new page. Okay, so let's go back into this. So we get this idea that in human beings experience results from memory, since many memories of the same thing result in the capacity of a single experience, right? So we have this distinction between science and craft, right? Now a craft arises, as he says, when many thoughts that arise from experience result in one universal judgment about things. So this is important here. So when we're talking about a craft, Right, we can say that a craft exists by a combination of experiences. Right, let's imagine these are a bundle of experiences. I don't know why that helps, but but that these experiences result in a common universal judgment. Right, so for instance, uh, and when I say it's a universal judgment, let's imagine that the, this is our bundle of experiences, right? Uh, so let's imagine we're taking home brewing as an example. Each one of these are cases where I try a different recipe, right? I try a different recipe. Now, ideally, his idea here is that it arises from many thoughts, right? So it'd be more than just recipes, but it'd be also learning from other people's experiences and so on and so forth, reading other people's books, whatever, right? But you can imagine, let's imagine that I'm, I'm brewing beer, and one of the things you need to make beer typically is considered, uh, you need clean water, right? You need clean water to make brew. To make beer. So let's imagine that I've made recipes on all of these different day, on all of these different experiences. And in each of these experiences, I used different, like this experience, I, I used a, a dirtier water and I ended up with a dirty, a dirtier, more foul tasting beer. Here I used clean water, it didn't taste bad. And you can imagine that over my experience, I'll eventually learn the universal judgment that no matter what kind of beer I'm brewing, um, dirty water will always result in bad beer. Therefore, universally, all beers require clean water, right, or something like this. That's an example of his idea of what a universal judgment is, and it's gained through the combination of experiences over time. Or, and it's important that this is one universal judgment about similar things. Whoa, sorry about that. So for practical purposes, experience seems no worse than craft. Um, indeed, we e even see that experienced people are actually more successful than those who have a rational account but lack experience, right? And so he says here to mention is when we're making the distinction between craft and experience. So if we go back to this sort of page here, I can't stand this, it's ugly. Um, if we go back to experience, right, 
there's some people who develop the craft, they develop the techniques, and there's some people who just learn on their own. They learn sheerly through their own experience. Think about the difference between a person who puts in uh, wood floors for a living, right? Maybe they went to school and someone taught them how to, the techniques for doing it and they gave them the right tools. And now compare a person who puts in hardwood floors who simply does it on their own, right? But you can imagine that if you do it on your own long enough, right, something like that, you can probably get to the point where you can maybe even do a better job than the person who knows the craft, right? Uh, so that's why, for instance, there are many cases that we can show where someone who's really well educated about something isn't always as successful as the person who learns by doing something. Okay, so Aristotle recognizes that practical difference here. But Aristotle still thinks that when it comes down to it, a craft is better than the experience, than having just experience because a craft delivers these universal judgments, right? Um, so, right, and, but it's clear though, so it's important here that I like sort of Aristotle here because he's arguing for the idea that, um, that, you, that, that we ought to, that the highest sort of form here is to gain universal knowledge and science and crafts and so on and so forth. But he also recognizes the practicality um, or the practical experience that a person who learns by doing can frequently excel, um, but without that base knowledge, they are much more liable to make error. Um, okay, so so that's sort of the first sort of thing here, and you can see this is really these are all remarks regarding Aristotle's epistemology, um, which there is no. Um, one succinct treatise of Aristotle's epistemology. It rather occurs throughout um, his work like this. Okay, so let me keep moving here. And you can see, I, I'm not gonna touch everything uh, that he discusses here. There's a lot of great stuff, um, but uh, um, so, so don't use this as a way to avoid actually reading the text. Okay, so let's go to the next one, right? Because in this goes down as why is the craft higher than experience? Well, because knowledge rather than experience implies wisdom, um, and of course the philosophy of being qua being is the philo is the science of philosophy. That is the investigation of philosophy, and his idea here is that wisdom to be wise is to know about things universally, to know how things work not simply to know how they've worked for you in the past, right? Um, so knowledge is more important, and so that means a craft is a development of knowledge, a techne, um, and of course, so is an episteme uh, in the more uh, technical sense, right? Um, and here he says, for instance, so let's keep moving here now, right? Further, he says at 10, we do not think any of the senses is wisdom, even though they are the most authoritative ways of recognizing particulars, they do not tell us why anything is so. Now that's an important sort of thing. So knowledge begins with our senses, right? Um, but, knowledge, but, no, but it's not complete with just our senses, right? Because what our senses do, right? Sense perception, right? The sense perception I have of, is always of a collection of objects. There's always a number of objects that I can see. Um, and when I say see here, I primarily mean sight, but um, you might say differentiate so I can hear different sounds and that sort of thing. So, but all of these is just a whole different number of objects. So right now I can see the computer screen, I can see this little pen, I can see my book, I can see my lamp on my desk, so on and so forth. All of these are just particulars. And here in the back of your mind, I want you to think about Plato's theory of the forms, right? And how he too is trying to understand the relationship between the particulars of our experience and the, and the, and the universalization of our judgments, right? We make universal judgments about all of the particulars without ever experiencing all of them. So knowledge begins with the sense experience, um, but because it's so plural, it, experience sense perception only gives me knowledge of particulars, or let's say particularity, the particularity of being, right? So what does that mean? It means that more has to happen um, in order for our sense perception to eventually develop into knowledge. Um, and of course, knowledge here is always going to be identified with the universal. 
right? And, and you have to keep in mind here too that Aristotle is a very nuanced and sophisticated thinker. So he typically is not going to say that when I have sense perception, he's going to say, yeah, my sense perception gives me something, right? You can maybe call that a thin type of knowledge, right? Uh, but his more, but the more robust account of knowledge I have, and the most robust is that of a science, and the science gives me universal knowledge, okay? So sort of move here, right? Uh, He says here, for instance, I'll just sort of read here at 25, he says, the difference between craft and science, so let's stick on that distinction, and other similar sorts of things has been discussed in the ethics, so you can take a look at his ethics. The point of our previous discussion is to show how in everyone's judgment, any discipline deserving the name of wisdom must describe first causes, i.e. the principles. Okay, so whatever it is that philosophy is doing, whatever sort of knowledge that philosophy gains, uh, that knowledge is going to consist in its being a science, right? But what exactly is a science? Well, a science is that which studies the first causes of its subject. Um, he calls it, he says first things. Um, he also says first causes. Um, and he also talks about the idea of first principles. And I think that if you look in the, in the scholarship of Aristotle's metaphysics, you'll see that there's a, there's a three, there's, there's a different number of things that Aristotle can refer to when he's talking about things. things. Now the causes is pretty simple. He's going to be talking about the four causes we looked at in the physics, and we'll see him actually delineate those within this text. Um, the principles, now the causes can be understood as principles, uh, but print, though there are principles above individual causes for specific substances. You'll recall um, last week, and I just sort of quickly do a reminder here, is that for Aristotle's theory of physics, is that physics is the study of particular beings that exist, right? That's the theory of substance. And he distinguishes between first order substances and second order substances. First order substances are the actual beings, the actual things. And, uh, but all substances can be delineated in terms of either, in terms of them always having form and matter. Um, and so that's an important sort of background knowledge that will help you as you come to this text. So let me here go back here to what I was looking at before. Okay, now th that means that metaphysics is trying to understand what the first principles are. Now, as I mentioned before, um, this is going to be known as being qua being, which means we're going to be looking at what are the first principles for being as such, right? That is, uh, I, I, it, now let's sort of put it in perspective. In Aristotle's model, I see with my eyes the book, right? I can feel it. That gives me this particular um, experience of this thing. Over time, I develop a memory about those things. Eventually, I develop a knowledge not just about the primary substance, but about the secondary substance, the idea of books, the concept of books, right? Um, and then over time, when I, you know, I begin to gain knowledge about books, right? Books are things that contain information, and that's its form, right? Um, its matter concerns the pages themselves. Uh, and so there's a lot of different distinctions going on here. But if we're looking at the question of first causes, then I don't really care about this particular being or this particular being. The type of first cause I'm interested in is what is a universal principle for any being, for every being, for beingness, as such? That's a very difficult question to answer and I actually encourage you to pause the video and just think through what that means or what you think that might mean. Um, and it's actually not as easy as it sounds. Um, okay, so that was the end of sort of section one. Um, so let's get move here to the next quote. I'm just following my quotations again. Um, so here's the next one. He says, perhaps this will be clear if we consider our judgments about the wise person, right? So first off, this tells us two different things. Um, number one, I also want you to see here, and I pointed this out, that Aristotle also knows that this isn't that clear, 
Uh, and you're pro for those of you who are reading this and are thinking, you know, I, it's difficult for me to know exactly what he's talking about. Well, Aristotle knows that. Um, number two, this also signifies one of the primary forms of Aristotle's methodology. One of the things he frequently does is he will say, okay, in order for us to understand something better, let's pause and let's think about what are the judgments we actually make. That is, let's describe the types of judgments we actually make about people who are wise. So what I love about this is that he takes this method of saying, let's pause the reflective part, let's leave the tower of philosophy, and let's go look into the world like a zoologist and say, well, let's catalog the different types of judgments and the different types of things that we seem to recognize that in our experience of wise people. And then from there, right, he sort of develops a data set, if you will, of um, examples of descriptive judgments that then he'll go back and say, what sort of causes um, or what framework can actually explain this? So anyway, that's sort of a, a side footnote, but I think it's important because you'll see he frequently does this. Um, he says, the one who is capable of knowing difficult things, i.e. things not easily known by human beings, is the wise person, for sense perception is common to everyone. So you can see here that his, the, when we ask the question, well, um, what is wisdom and who counts as wise, if we ask the question of sensation, well, that's not on the list, right? Because everyone has sensation, including fools, including animals, right? And then no one would ask, uh, would seek wisdom out with their dog or their cat, right? So it can't be sensation. Wisdom can't, can't be consist in sensation, right? Um, ultimately, he's going to say, does it consist in a craft? Not really unless you're making that thing. Does it consist in the person who has knowledge? And that actually is going to be his answer, is that the person who has knowledge is actually the person we consider to be wise. They have knowledge of things that are hard to understand, like things that are universal, right? Things that go beyond your sense perception, right? And that's the difference between a craft and a science, right? He says, the most exact sciences are those that, that more than the others study the first things. So the more exact a science is, the closer it is to the pr most primary principles, right? So he says, says the sciences that are derived from fewer princi principles, for instance, arithmetic are more, uh, are more exact than those, for instance, geometry that require further principles, right? So you can see here that the more specified a subject gets by articulating more, uh, uh, more principles and more differences among principles, then what you're doing is you're not getting his most exact science of being. And you can see this is that, think, Aristotle's going to have this idea that we can have a taxonomy of the sciences, right? We have uh, the being qua being, all universal things. And then upon that, you could have physics, right? Um, ethics, uh, logic, et cetera, et cetera. And you can have a, a sort of tree of knowledge. Um, but the important here is that each movement of the tree each, as you move from one science, let's say fit, um, moving from metaphysics to physics, you're going to have a further differentiation of principles. So it's not as exact. Um, so Aristotle's conception of exactness is not being verbose, actually quite the reverse. To be exact is to be simple. That is, it is to identify the universal first principle of something. That is what it means to be exact, right? Um, he says, further, the most superior science, the one that is superior to any subordinate science, is that one that knows the end for which a given thing should be done. This end is something good, and in general, the end is what is best in every sort of nature. So here we get this further idea, right? So the best sort of science is not simply the one that tells us, um, gives us a description of something, but actually tells us what is best and how things should be, right? Uh, and so you can see here that uh, there's different types of forms of knowledge that the wise person has, right? One form of knowledge is they should know about the world. Let's just call this they have knowledge about things, but they also should have knowledge regarding the way things should be um, as well. And this is sort of Aristotle's conception. Uh, and this will be part, this is, it's sort of nuanced, but it relates to his conception of telos, 
One thing that's really important here that I always draw out here is that he argues that this science is not productive. That's sort of a very important sort of difference here. If we're talking about different types of science, um, many sciences are productive, right? So for instance, consider the idea that um, computer science is productive, right? Computer science allows us to produce new forms of knowledge regarding computers, languages, and stuff like that. And I apologize for those computer scientists out there. I'm probably butchering your whole field of su subjects, so my apologies, right? Or think, for instance, about um, think about uh, physics, right? Uh, um, experimental physics. Like experimental physicists, they can take their knowledge or they can experiment, and they can slowly gain more knowledge. They can produce new ideas about new things. Philosophy or metaphysics doesn't really do this, right? That is, and this will be an important point that I think, and Aristotle is not exactly arguing this right here, but I think that philosophy is not productive. Um, and this is sort of an important point. Um, you know, for instance, if you decide to become a philosophy major, and you're sitting and you meet your... Um, your girlfriend or boyfriend's father. And he says, so what exactly do you do? And you say, I do philosophy. He's asking, what are you gonna do with that? And and here the idea is, well, actually nothing. It's not a productive thing. The point of philosophy isn't to gain knowledge to manipulate the world. Because remember, the science of philosophy, metaphysics here, is about all things qua being, right? Um, in order to produce things, you have to have particular types of beings. And here we're interested in the universal attributes of all beings. So whatever knowledge we produce isn't productive. It rather is illuminating or enlightening, right? It gives us the answer to why things are. It gives us the highest universal knowledge, but not so we can manipulate things. So philosophy is not productive, and neither is metaphysics. That's not to say that it doesn't, you're not able to gain knowledge through it. It simply means um, that it is something that we desire not for instrumental reasons, but rather for intrinsic reasons. That is, we value, we, his argument here is we value knowledge of reality, right, for its own sake, right, simply because we desire, we human beings all by nature desire to know. It's in our nature to want to do this. That's why we desire it intrinsically or it's intrinsically valuable to itself. Now, what does this mean? It means that philosophy actually is free, right? It's, he says it is a free science. In the same way that a person is said to be free, if that person pursues their own interests, that they pursue things for their own sake, right? He says philosophy is the same, metaphysics here, it's free. It pursues something for its own sake. Right. Um, so, right. So, for instance, compare philosophy, metaphysics with, say, for instance, political science. Political science is not free because political science aims to uncover the principles using Aristotle's sense of science here to uncover the causes and the principles of politics right of social existence but that means that everything that the political scientist does revolves around that idea is if you will chain to that idea conversely philosophy since it doesn't it's not a techne and it, it's not productive it desire it is a free science right um so he says for instance and this science of first causes, um, causes satisfies both conditions of being divine. Now, it's interesting here, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but Arist whoops, Aristotle does refer to, um, to metaphysics as divine. Why? In two reasons. The first reason is the type of knowledge we're after is the type of knowledge that uh, we would, might imagine a god would have. Right, because if God created all beings, then God would have this knowledge. So it's divine in that sense. Um, and two, um, it, it is uh, it is the we are seeking knowledge regarding the causes of all things, uh, which is a seemingly divine. Now Aristotle here, and there's a debate here. You can see Owen's text on this. There's a big debate here in terms of whether or not er, how to what degree Aristotle is concerned with the theological when he discusses the divine 
Um, Owen argues that he's actually, at the end of the day, concerned with the theological. I don't actually disagree with him, but I don't think that's very interesting for us today. So my concern with Aristotle concerns um, a non-theological evaluation of his metaphysics. Um, this is a big debate, actually. Now, in section three here, Aristotle says, listen, there are four different causes. So, okay, we've talked about what a science is. And a science is something that seeks the first principles of things and the causes. There are four types of causes, right? What are the four types of causes? Now, in a previous video, we've looked at these. The first is what we call um, the formal cause. Well, we can, they're in different orders here. I'm following the order that Aristotle gives in this, met, in this text. Um, there's the formal cause. There's the material cause. There's the efficient cause. And then number four, there's the final cause. Now, we should be clear that in the metaphysics, at least in this section, Aristotle is not using this language. So let's take a look at what he actually says. He says, causes are spoken of in four ways. The first regards the essence of something. And you'll recall that when he talked about his theory of substance, right, every substance has form and matter. Form refers to the essence, right? Um, so the first type of cause is to understand just the essence of something, that is, what is the integral formal nature of any um, substance that exists? The next is the matter and the subject. This is what we can call what he calls the material cause. That's what something's actually made of. And that's where we can delineate types of elements. And Aristotle does this and he talks about this material cause. The next is what he calls the principle of motion, which I think is a beautiful definition for the efficient cause. The way we discussed efficient cause here was that an efficient cause is the thing which is able to create um, something's coming into being. Every, every coming into being is a motion, right? So the idea here is the principle of motion of something that enables something to move is the efficient cause here. So at least that's how I interpret it. Um, let's see here. The next, of course, is the final cause, and this refers to what something is for. Why does something exist? That is, it is the final, it is the final end. Of, it's the, it, the final cause seeks to understand the end towards which something exists, right? Uh, and in a certain way, that's the big question when people say, what's the meaning of life? What they're asking for is what's the final cause of life? Right. Uh, it's important to understand that for Aristotle, in, meta, in the science of metaphysics, that question is a, f a question regarding first principles. Uh, ironically, though, it's a question most of us ask at the end of our life. Um, so something interesting there to think about. Now, he says, here's where he's going to sort of go through these philosophers. Now, we've had a video on most of these philosophers, so I'm not going to spend too much detail reviewing them. But this is what Aristotle does, which is typical of him. He goes through and he talks about the different philosophers. He says, the first, and here he's sort of thinking about the pre-Socratic philosophers and saying that there's these four different types of causes, and the different pre-Socratic philosophers seem to be working um, for different um, working on different causes. So you look at the material cause, right? Here we get, for instance, we get the work of Thales and the other pre-Socratics, right? Where the idea here is that, right, is that everything is made up of one thing, right? And so, and by the way, this is where we get some knowledge of Aristotle, and it's clear that even Aristotle didn't fully know all the information about Thales. Um, because he says, Thales, the originator of this sort of philosophy, says it's water. Presumably, he reached this judgment from seeing that what nourishes all life is wet, and so on and so forth. You can see here, by his language of presumably, it's clear that even Aristotle does not have adequate knowledge regarding what Thales actually taught. So, Thales is quite ancient here. Um, of course, then, and he mentions, for instance, that there's a story in the mythology, Oceanus and Telethes about the idea that the oath of the gods is water and so there's this ancient sort of sense of water and so it's interesting here because Socrates, not sorry, Aristotle recognizes that even though Thales developed this first sort of material causal explanation 
right? He's pulling from his own mythological history as well. Um, so we are products of our society. And that should make sense in Aristotle's epistemology, where our sense perceptions get compounded into experience, and we learn through the experience of others, right? Um, that's why, for instance, someone can tell me the stove's hot, and I don't have to touch it to know. I learn from someone else telling me. Um, and so it's possible that Thales begins to think of the material cause because actually the material cause was first being introduced in this ancient mythology. Um, next, of course, he mentions Anaximenes and Diogenes, right, uh, who, who offer their own principle. He mentions Heraclitus here, who talks about fire. So this goes to a conception of Heraclitus, um, his primary element being fire. In an earlier video, I reject this thesis. I guess I differ from Aristotle, so you might not want to believe me. Um, Empedocles, right, he takes the four bodies to be the principles. And you can see that what Aristotle is doing is he's giving us a catalog of how different material causes were developed over time. Um, Anaxagoras, right, remember Anaxagoras has this notion of the apuron, right? The principles are unlimited, they're infinite in form, right? So there's these different suggestions, all of them are revolving really around this notion of matter um, and what something is made of. Um, but you can see here, Aristotle, it's interesting here because it's clear that these guys were wrong. And it's even clear to Aristotle that they're wrong, but he says this. He says, but as people thus advanced, reality itself showed them the way and compelled them to search. For however true it might be that all things come to be and perishing is from one, that's the problem of the one and the many, right? Still, why does this happen? What is the cause? So you can see here that Aristotle says that all of these different philosophers, they come up with different ideas. And they, they come up with ideas by looking and by recognizing there's something right in the other guy's idea, but also recognizing and giving an account. But here I love this idea is that, I love the translation as well, is that reality seems to compel. Um, and I think that's an important um, uh, understanding you have to grasp when you look at Aristotle. His idea here is that, the world is compelling us, reality, right? Um, you can see here that Aristotle is, would be staunchly opposed to any sort of subjectivist epistemology. Sure, there are problems of, of subjectivism and, self, and sense perception. Aristotle would certainly agree with that. But his idea here is that simply because our senses are not always adequate doesn't mean we don't have access to reality. Reality is compelling us. Um, and, and also this question of why is compelling us, right? Um, and so, for instance, then he goes on to mention, for instance, Parmenides, who he says, interestingly enough, Parmenides seems to suddenly realize um, that there's a different type of cause, albeit different from the material, right? He says nature as a whole is immobile. Clearly, that's Parmenides' idea. But he says Parmenides um, seems to have noticed um, and in a certain way, it discovers two different causes, right? Um, and here the idea, I think, is that what Parmenides discovers is what Aristotle wants to call the formal cause, the essence of something. When, remember, um, when Parmenides says that being is and non-being is not, right? You can see he's trying to do metaphysics because he's doing, he wants to understand the universal principles of being. And one of the universal principles, I guess, is the notion that being um, has its own essence. And that essence means that, it, that uh, it's complete in its being, right? And so the idea here is that and that doesn't make sense when you look at the material world and everything's changing, like in Heraclitus, right? So in a way, Aristotle suggests that Parmenides discovers formal cause, right? We suddenly see the recognition that there's something like formal cause, which is different than just material cause. Now, clearly Parmenides did not understand it in those terms, uh, but this is how um, Aristotle is appropriating pre-Socratic um, philosophical history. And again, we see the same phrase again. It was as though the truth itself compelled them, 
right? Um, so there, it's sort of a beautiful, almost mystical sort of insistence here um, that reality and our sense of wonderment are almost attuned to propel, right? The, the, the reality propels our wonderment in a certain way. It's fascinating. Um, let's keep going here. Um, let's see here. Um, Hesiod. Now he gives the example of Hesiod, and we've mentioned Hesiod in an earlier um, video here. You'll recall that Hesiod is really the earliest of the Greek poets and the bards to articulate um, a theory of the gods, that God's creating the world and out of chaos and all of this. And the reason that Aristotle is mentioning this is because the Hesiod is looking for a different cause. He's not looking for this formal cause, the Parmenides. He's not looking for this um, material cause like in Thales. But what we see with Hesiod is the notion of an efficient cause. We see the idea that Hesiod wants to understand who actually first got all of this stuff to move. Right? And, and so in the same way, using contemporary vernacular, this notion of the Big Bang satisfies the conditions for articulated in an efficient cause of being. Right? Uh, now, there, of course, there's debate about it, and we won't get into that. But it is in, there's efficient cause here. Right? Um, so, for instance, for those of you who are, um, come from the Christian perspective, you can say that in, in the, or I guess, Jewish or even Muslim perspective, Right, the um, the the book of Genesis, right? The God created the universe in seven days and all that sort of business. That all refers to the efficient causation of the world, right? Um, so it's important you see how, that's at least what, certainly what Aristotle would say if you'd ever read that text, right? But he says this. He says they were like unskilled boxers in fights who, in the course of moving around, often land good punches, but are not guided by knowledge. Right. Um, you could sort. Of, it's interesting here. I love these sorts of passages because you get the, you get a sort of sense of, of who Aristotle was, for instance. But he says this is like these guys in the ring, and every once in a while they can get a good knock in, but they, they don't have knowledge of what they're doing, and so it's sort of a hit or miss. Um, and that certainly is probably what it felt like as you yourself were reading uh, Aristotle's Metaphysics. Um, not as bad, I'm sorry, when you're reading the pre-Socratic philosophers in our earlier videos. Um, he goes on to also mention Anaxagoras, who uses the mind as an ad hoc device or a machine for the universe. Right? So you have this notion of idealism even developing in metaphysics. You have Empedocles, for instance. Um, he did not take the principle of motion to be one, but assumed different contrary principles. Um, and then eventually in four types of matter four material elements. And then there's Leucippus and Democritus who are seeking in their atomistic theory another type of material explanation. Um, but it's interesting here, um, there's also, um, you can see here that Aristotle suggests that the atomists take the differentia to be the causes of the other things, right? Remember in the theory of atomism, you have these different atoms, none which can be cut. Right? And so, for instance, when you go from having a person, right, um, right, a, let's see here, let's say a person dies, right, and then a tree grows in the same spot, right, so a person goes from, from being this thing to being this thing, right, the atoms just move around, right, the atoms don't actually change, it's just the arrangement that is the differences between the atoms that actually is the cause of, of everything we're experiencing. So um, the atomists propose a different sort of explanation, um, but it still falls in line with a, a I would say, a, um, a material explanation. So anyway, so that's sort of, it's sort of interesting there. Um, now, so that sort of concludes Aristotle's discussion of um, these primary of these earlier pre-Socratics. Now comes his sort of discussion of Plato, who he actually spends a pretty good amount of time on. I don't think nearly enough because he delineates so many different arguments, and so he gives us a fairly interesting critique of Plato's work. Right, um, he first says the idea is first thing here is that Plato was influenced 
by Heraclitus, and he was influenced by Kratlas, and this idea that all things are constantly changing, and if everything's constantly changing, then you can't really understand something, right? You can't have knowledge of that thing because it's in motion. Um, and, so he, and so Plato gets that from Heraclitus, actually. Um, and then he says, though, but Plato also was influenced by Socrates, and Socrates didn't really care about material explanations. He cared about ethics. And, 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 he, and he cared about determining how we ought to live and using an evaluation of our ideas to do that, right? So you see this th there. And then finally, this third influence from Plato comes from Pythagoras, where you see the discussion of forms and numbers. And, and this, of course, you see what Aristotle is doing is he's, he's contextualizing Plato um, for us, right? Um, and I'm, I'm not going to read all of this, right? Um, I will on the next passage here, right? Uh, but one of the things he's going to say is that they differ from the forms in that, um, let's see here. Further, he says, apart from perceptual things and forms, there are also mathematical objects in between. So one of the things that Aristotle is doing here is he gives a sort of quick synopsis of the theory of the forms. And mathematical objects are not sense percept, per, you can't sense those with perception, but they're not forms, they're somewhere in between. This is problematic for Aristotle, and we'll see why in a minute. He says, these, diff, the, these differ from perceptible things and being everlasting and mobile, right? The, L, the Pythagorean theorem never changes. They differ from forms in that they are many in the, many of the same kind. So there's many different types of um, uh, mathematical formulas and principles and axioms. Whereas there's only, and there's many different types of numbers, whereas there's only one form for each thing, right? There's only one form of humanness, for instance. Now, what is the problem with, uh, what, what is the critique or criticism that Aristotle has here? Let me see if I can move forward. Um, actually, I want us to read these sections. And this, you can see here, is, this is at 990A34. He says, as for those who posited ideas, right? He's thinking of the ideas, eidos, Plato. The first objection is that in seeking a grasp of the causes of beings in the world, they introduce different things equal in number to them, right? So here's the basic idea, is that it looks like, right, for every object that you can understand, there has to be another form, right? So you have the object, but the object can only be made comprehensible by understanding the form of that object. The problem is, if you do this for all the objects, whether or not they're triangles, squares, um, people, um, spears, swords, whatever, it looks like you need as many forms as you have objects. That is, it looks like instead of explaining reality, you're actually just duplicating reality. And you're just creating the world again in order to explain it. But that, of course, doesn't actually solve it. Because what we'll see is that then, of course, and this is known as the third man argument, you have to understand, it looks like you have to create another duplication to solve the relationship between the first and the world. But we'll get to that in a moment. So he says, it is though someone wanted to count things and thought he could not do it if there were fewer of them, but could do it if he added more. For the forms they resorted to in the search of the causes of things are practically equal in number to the things in this world. For take each kind of thing that has a one over many, both substances and non-substances, both things in this world and everlasting things, in each case there is some, one over many, that has the same name as the same many, right? He basically just says, listen, you're just multiplying the question. You're not solving the question or solving the problem. Now, in this passage, Plato actually initiates, I'm sorry, Aristotle initiates a whole bunch of objections, right? And I'll just sort of take them in turn. He says, further, none of the proofs we offer to show that there are forms appear to succeed. So all of the proofs you can give to, for the theory of the forms don't succeed. Some of them are actually invalid. That is, they're just not, logic, not logical. Others yield forms of things that we think have no forms, right? For instance, Plato even discusses this. Is he, he, Plato denies that there's a form of dirtness. Well, why? Why isn't there a form of it? It's difficult to know in the theory of the forms what you need an idea for and what you don't need an idea for. So for instance, we have the form of humanness, but what about fat humanness or thin humanness? Is there a separate form for that, um, right? He says, for the arguments from the sciences yield forms of all the things of which they are sciences. The one over many yields forms even of negation. So he says, 
For instance, if you say something's not the case, the theory of the forms would indicate that there has to be a form of a negation, a form of, of like if I say it's not the case that he jumped, then there has to be a form of not jumping. What? That doesn't make any sense, um, especially if the forms are meant to explain being, right? He says, and the arguments from thinking about something that is perish yields forms of things that perish, right? So you need things that are perishing and changing, right? You have to have forms that are changing and perishing, and that doesn't make any sense. Not when the whole idea is the form is everlasting. Um, you shouldn't need a perishable form, as, as it were, right? Um, he says, further, among the more uh, accurate arguments, some produce ideas and relatives, right? So you get, you get relative relations. Are there forms for relative relations? But if there's forms for relative relations, then those forms can only signify one sort of relative thing, and they lack that universality that Plato suggests the forms has. He says, whereas that we deny that, that all... Um, that these things are a kind of things in their own right. So here he's suggesting, listen, relations are not the same things as the, as, um, the, as ideas, but it's difficult to differentiate those in Plato's theory of the forms. And if you thought about the divided line hard, you probably started to be a little unclear yourself about what exactly is the technical specificity of this theory. Um, finally, there's what he calls the third man argument. And the third man argument basically has the idea that in Plato's theory, you have this ultimate ideal form, and then you have the particular instance of something, right? So that's the particular. The idea here is that the, the idea of the form is that the form is what makes um, the particular intelligible. But the form is not a perfect version. I'm sorry, the particular here, right? Let's say this is the exist, we have the form of humanness, and this is a particular human, right? No particular human is going to perfectly encapsulate or participate in the form of humanness in its ideal reality, or in its an ideal sense. So that means there's a difference between the two. If there's a difference, then the question is, how do you understand that these two things are related? Well, it seems like you have to postulate a third relation. But then how do you know, right, a third man? And if you're going to understand the relation between the third man and the form, it looks like you have to postulate a fourth man, a fifth man, a sixth man. And it looks like the theory of the forms actually creates what Aristotle calls an infinite regress problem. That is, the system of explanations goes on infinitely, goes on forever. And if that's the case, the explanation is actually never given. Um, so, and he discusses this later in the metaphysics, and you can, he discusses it in a number of different places. Um, and in general, the arguments of the forms undermine the existence of things that matter more to us than the existence of ideas does. And this one is really true and actually speaks to our own experience. So for instance, think about the, his idea is that the forms are more real and have more value and meaning, right, than the things that, that participate in them. So take, for instance, the form of motherness, right, the form mother, and take your own mother. Which one is more important to you? Um, even for the philosopher, it's their own mother that matters, not the idea of mother, right? And so you can see here is that I think that this Aristotle here is signifying that there's a sort of there's a sort of break between the everyday um, and what we consider to be wise, right? Uh, there's a sort of break in the system of explanations here where. Uh, it looks like our intellect goes on holiday, whereas our real everyday life goes somewhere else entirely. Um, and so for this reason, and among others, it's insufficient, right? He says, one might be especially puzzled about what on earth forms contribute to perceptible things, right? So that's another problem here, is that if you take Plato's theory of duality between being and becoming, right? The idea is that the becoming experience we're having, things are changing and all of this, that none of this is real. But the problem is this is what we're experiencing. Okay, we can intellect and we can think this, but this is what we're experiencing. And the theory of the forms doesn't explain why we're perceiving these things in, in the realm of becoming. And it doesn't explain why the forms are even needed for this. It looks like we can perceptibly sense things without any intelligible knowledge of these forms. Uh, okay. 
Um, he says, and he, he also rejects the idea. He says, some people think that the forms are patterns um, that, that are participating. He says, this is empty talk. So he rejects this straight out. It's unlikely that Plato thought this. I think he's attacking a bad reading of Plato. Um, and then, of course, he attacks Plato by even citing the Phaedo. Right, um, and the Phaedo is a dialogue we didn't read, but it's in the it's in your book here, right? In which, in according to the Phaedo, the forms are the cause of both of being and of coming to be, right? So the forms are the cause of being, and they're the forms of and they're the cause of becoming. What? How can something both be being and becoming at the same time? It doesn't make sense, right? Um, and then he discusses some of the mathematics and the relationship between mathematics. I'm going to move ahead here to the end because I've been talking for over an hour and I need to conclude this video. I'm sure that you want me to. And let's just briefly look at what Aristotle talks about in book four. Um, now this is when Aristotle tries to give his own account after sort of attacking, uh, looking at the history and attacking Plato a little bit. He says, listen, there is a science that studies being in itself. Uh, being in its own right, and the phrase he uses there is being qua being, right? Um, but be the sci this science, metaphysics, studies being qua being, and it also studies the properties of being as such, right? Now, as we mentioned before, what we're looking out for are principles. That is, we're looking for the highest causes that clearly must be the causes of nature, some subject, as it is in its own right. Now, he's going to say here to be careful because metaphysics doesn't simply concern um, uh, material things. And neither does metaphysics concern the causes of... Um, well, here, wait, let me get there here. I'll stick with the text. Right? Metaphysics is, concerns more than just nature, for instance. He says, being is spoken of in many ways, but always with reference to one thing. Right, that is to some one nature, right, and homogeneously. Now, remember when he made that distinction, and this is why we wanted you to read it, and so you knew what he was talking about here. Um, but we talk about being in a whole bunch of different ways, but ultimately, we talk about being in one way being in terms of its unity, right, the existence of all things, all things have existence, right? So, you watching this video, as well as your grandchildren a hundred years from now and you know a, a star or a moon in a distant galaxy all of these things have being and the goal is can we understand the principles that undergird all of them um, across the entire literally the entire universe as well as uh, allegorically um, Okay, so similarly then, being is spoken in many ways, but all of them are reference to one principle. So what is this primary principle? He says, uh, and this is quite important, in every case, the dominant concern of a science is with its primary object, right? So this is important. We're sort of getting a sort of sense here. Every science is looking after a certain object, right? So physics has the object of the physical Chemistry has the object of the chemical, and so on and so forth. Psychology has the object of the psyche. So what is the object of metaphysics? He says, if then this primary object is substance, the philosopher must grasp the causes of the substance. Now remember I said to you that the term that Aristotle uses for being is osia, and it actually means being, right? Um, but this gets translated by the word substance. And there we can talk about primary substances, secondary substances. See the video on the physics and categories for this a more a longer discussion on this. But here he says, okay, so metaphysics, the object of our study is being in any of these beings, any of these things. And we begin with an evaluation of substance. Um, and we do it through the causes and so on and so forth. So there must, and here it's important, he says, there must be first philosophy and there can also be second philosophy. That is... Once philosophers can discover that there's other principles that fall beneath other principles. And so we can talk about there being the highest philosophy and there's secondary forms of philosophy. And this is what this is exactly how you can understand metaphysics the relationship between metaphysics and ethics, for instance. Because ethics concerns the being of action, how we ought to act. Uh, metaphysics concerns all forms of being, 
that include ethics, but also others. So ethics is a second type of philosophy. Metaphysics, or the being qual being, is the first. Now, being and unity are the same, same and have a single nature, since they imply each other. So here, the idea is, when we talk about being, being is, we're, we're thinking about being not in terms of its material um, differentiation, but we're thinking of being in terms of it being all one, being a unity, in almost in this Parmenidean sense. All right, so let me move here down. Um, and he discusses the discuss he discusses contraries a little bit here. A contrary, remember, is this idea of hot, cold, things like this. And he thinks that substances receive these contraries. Remember, again, this is from an earlier discussion, right? But he says here, interestingly enough, different sciences are required only if it's true both that the things have no one and that they're uh, no one common property and that their accounts are not referred to one thing. So we can say that. Scientists can study many things, but they differ when their object is totally different, is completely different, um, and that is they can't be shared, right? So if the object of my study is the polis, well, that's not the same science as metaphysics because I'm looking at more than that. Uh, it's quite, you know, it's pretty obvious stuff, I think, but you can see here the systematicity of his approach. He says, hence, it's clearly a task that the science of being is to know both what being and unity are and also their coincidences, and to know the attributes that are distinctive of being insofar as they are beings, and it is the philosopher's task to investigate the truth about these things. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead here to the end. Um, let's see here, because I realize I'm going too long here. Uh, yeah, and here's where I want to skip to. Um, and you can, and I encourage you to take a look and read all this in more detail, right? Um, let's jump to the final principle, and this is where we'll end our discussion for today. He says, for a principle that we must already, the, the goal is to have these principles. Where do we get these principles? Well, these principles we use to make our deductions, right? And these principles are something that we gain through the mind, through noose, right? They're not things that can be demonstrated. We looked at this in our previous discussion on the categories. Right? You can't demonstrate a principle because a principle is the thing by which one makes demonstrations. Right, um, so you can't demonstrate it in the same. You can't demonstrate it. You just have to accept it by the mind. You grasp it. Right. He says so. It's so that's important that a principle also that means a principle is not an assumption. Right. Um, this is a lot of times uh, I think students in philosophy make this mistake. Uh, we can talk about principles. But a principle is not an assumption. It's not something that I'm just going to act like it's true. Why? Um, here, I'll type it out, write it out. It's not an assumption. Gee, my handwriting's bad, right? But a principle is not an assumption. It's something we take as given and we grasp it with the mind. But it's not an assumption because it's not because an assumption is something that in principle could be demonstrable, something that we could prove or not. We're just going. To, assumption is when you just temporarily agree to something and agree that something's true in order to figure out what might be the case. A principle is something you have to accept regardless um, of any demonstration. Um, so principles are not assumptions. So in person, some, when someone says, for instance, um, you can't contradict yourself, that's not an assumption, right? That's a necess necessary condition for making any argument. In fact, this brings us to last. What is the first principle Aristotle suggests? Um, in metaphysics, it's the principle of non-contradiction. And this is a very important passage. He says, let us next say what this principle is, that it is impossible for the same thing both to belong and not to belong at the same time to the same thing and in the same respect. And let us assume we have drawn all the further distinctions uh, that might be drawn to meet logical complaints. This, then, is the firmest principle of all since it has the distinguishing feature previously mentioned. That is, this principle is present for any, for any investigation of anything, right? That is, it is a first principle for being qua being. Being cannot both be and, be and not be at the same time and in the same way and in the same respect, right? Being is univocal and it has this unity. Um, and 
the law of non-contradiction is a rational operation that's required for us to understand things, but the law of non-contradiction signifies a principle for being as such. This is the first sort of major development in Aristotle's metaphysics, uh, and this is where we'll conclude our video today. I apologize I didn't get to everything I highlighted, uh, but it's a great text, but I hope you got a sense here of how if you just stick very closely with the text, you can really begin to flesh out arguments, uh, Aristotle's argument. So I encourage you to do these close readings on your own. Thank you guys very much for watching this video. I'll see you guys online.